Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be there. Let's start. This is Defeating VPN Always On. My name is Maxime Clemens. As you can hear, I'm French. Hopefully, the speech to text will be able to translate what I, I can say. Sorry if that's not the case. Yeah, okay. I got my first indestinable, okay. Let's go. Um, I work in Luxembourg. It's a very small country. I work in the uh, PwC um, company. Do, uh, do we have anyone from PwC in the room? Yeah, I'm a great, okay. Um, okay, let's start. So I will try to show you how always on can be a bit off sometimes. So the reason of this talk is that I encountered this kind of control uh, during some penetration tests. On, um, I managed to find one bypass, then two bypasses, then three. So I decided to dig further and to try uh, to better understand how it works on when it does not really work. Um, we will start with the high level concepts with the components of always on. Then we will see the practical analysis, so uh, uh, what it is made of. We will almost directly identify some naive attacks. I would say naive because we don't need to understand exactly how it is implemented. Um, just based on the documentation, we will find some attacks that uh, might work or not. Um, it, those attacks on their results will, will raise some questions. Um, uh, maybe we will need to find a uh, look at behind the scene to better understand uh, uh, all these results. We will inspect some of the filters to try to find new attacks that will allow us to break free from the always on. And then obviously I will finish with some recommendations. So who is this all for? Um, definitely red teams or offensive teams. Um, I will try to show some of the attacks that I found or that will allow you to defeat uh, always on to bypass uh, uh, the, um, the, this control. For the blue team, of course, um, I will try to show what are the main issues that we have in the most popular VPN agents or definitely we will try to uh, improve the situation here. Uh, most importantly, we can find a lot of ways to actually bypass uh, VPN always on. I will be focusing on all the techniques that we can use without privileges, without complex tools, without uh, uh, specific attacks. So I'm really looking forward to uh, showing some attacks that anyone can replay so that you can uh, uh, use it in your offensive assignments, for instance. On, uh, importantly, on the victim side, on, on the victim side as well, uh, I want to run some attacks that might work without privileges. So the main concept, I guess, that I don't need to explain what a VPN a is, but I'm uh, especially referring to uh, VPN in the corporate uh, uh, context. So if the company, the organization tries to protect their remote end users, then of course they will try to uh, implement uh, a tunnel so that you can get all the protection from the corporate uh, controls. Uh, if you know VPN, then you might already know the differences between split tunneling, foot tunneling, but today we are going to focus on uh, always on, which is also called lockdown mode, uh, which is again uh, like a, a full tunneling mode, but then with the user is not even able to uh, disable the, the control. So it will be forced to connect to the VPN gateway. Uh, today I selected three uh, editors that uh, we are going to attack and we are going to review what, uh, how they are implementing such controls but basically they are almost all the same. Um, if uh, you look at the documentation of other providers you will see that they are probably going to be vulnerable to the same things. So this is the typical uh, symptoms of having um, uh, unforced always on on a Windows machine for instance. You will see the uh, quite typical uh, general failure, like when you are doing some ping command, it will not say that the ping is not uh, uh, coming back and that there is no response. No, it will be this weird message, general failure. So this is kind of a typical symptom that we can have. And obviously, if the tunnel is not established, like I took AVNT for instance, then in that case we have a restricted network access. We will get some error messages from the browser. Um, and again, since it is enforced, the end user is not able of, um, uh, cannot disable this, this control. So we will get some uh, other error messages. In the scenarios that uh, we have, obviously if we are admin, if we can steal all the data by plugging a USB key, if we can uh, decrypt the drive, 
all those we are not, uh, um, I would say they are not relevant for this scenario. I'm really speaking about a scenario in which the endpoint is very well hardened, so the end user doesn't have any uh, admin access, we cannot just plug a USB key and so on and so on. So the, pro the web proxy in the corporate environment is doing TLS interception, so everything is there uh, to actually prevent any kind of um, data leak or uh, 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 any kind of um, uh, C2 uh, bidirectional channel. But another thing very important, we know there have been many talks about um, uh, exfiltration with uh, sound, uh, electromagnetic noise, pixel, QR code and so on. They are great but we are really interested in simple things with uh, high uh, throughput. So we want to be able to exfiltrate big uh, uh, files for instance. So we need to find much effective attacks. The scenarios that we are going to consider um, obviously the first one, hacker in the middle, the hacker does not have access to the target device, so the target device can be a laptop um, uh, typically and the other scenario that we can consider is if uh, the attacker has access to the device or if it is a malicious insider then obviously it will be able to do both uh, commands on the laptops as well as uh, controlling the, uh, controlling the, the network. So enough theory, let's have a look at some of the components that uh, are needed for always on to work. The first one is trusted network detection. Of course the local VPN agent must understand, must conclude if it has to connect to the gateway or not. Um, so for this the algorithm that are being implemented in the VPN agents are called trusted network detection. When outside of the trusted network uh, the VPN agent needs to know if the gateway is directly accessible or not because if uh, you are behind a captive portal for instance you will not be able to reach the VPN gateway and you will be first uh, um, allowed some specific network access until you can authenticate on the captive portal, pay what you want or just enter your credentials until um, you are authenticated and then you can eventually reach out the VPN gateway. If we look at the impl implementation of trusted network detection in the three VPN agents that I selected, um, it's more or less the same. Uh, let's take for example Cisco. Uh, to determine if we are on the trusted network then it will use, uh, it can use the internal DNS suffix or the internal DNS server IP. Um, just to mention uh, a very important point here, Cisco is the only one uh, provider that is actually proposing an option that is secure enough. So if you want to determine that you are on the uh, LAN, on the trusted network, then you can still use um, the fingerprint of a TLS certificate. So this, in my opinion, is the only way you can do that properly, but it's so impractical that, to be honest, I've never seen that uh, implemented correctly in the wild. For the other ones, um, you can uh, see that it's also something that are uh, uh, pushed by JHCP offers or uh, IP settings, these kind of things. And I'm already showing the uh, path and location of these settings on logs because we will actually find all the values that we need uh, to attack these uh, agents. And another observation is the files that we have there on the logs, they are all user readable. So you do not even need admin rights to get these files, to read them and to understand what is expected um, so that the VPN agent will conclude that it's on the um, uh, uh, trusted network. And obviously most of these checks can be tricked. Um, and finally I referred to uh, split tunneling earlier. This is also where you will find all the exceptions for the IPs, domains that uh, you can connect to directly. So if you look at these files you might already find everything you need to uh, uh, perform your attack if you want to break free from, uh, from this situation. Let's move on to the captive portal detection. So it's a kind of security trade-off for connectivity. Um, I just explained there what are the main algorithms that are being used to determine if you have, if the laptop, if the system that you are using is directly connected to the internet or not. So Microsoft, Google, Apple, it's quite similar in the way that they are performing some HTTP requests and depending on the response, of course, uh, it will determine that you are directly connected or not. And when not, if this check fails, 
then it is assumed that you are behind a captive portal, and this is where you will get the, uh, you know, the prompt that you need to authenticate with your web browser before you can get access to, to the internet. Um, the VPN agents that uh, I'm going to, um, I would say, attack uh, today are using a variant of this, or, well, a combination of these tech checks, um, but for Cisco it's a bit different, it will use some uh, HTTPS uh, uh, connection before, but all these, te all these tests can be, can be tricked. So we had a look at trusted network detection, we had a look at captive portal detection, obviously um, you know that we can already find some attacks that we can, that we can try. But just a quick reminder, what we are trying to achieve, to achieve there um, is to do some data exfiltration, but with, uh, I would say, important files, very big stuff, or to establish a common control uh, with a bidirectional channel. So this is what we try to achieve there. And again, with the constraints, we are not admin or we do not even have access to the laptop itself. We want simple um, attacks. We don't want to use um, uh, binaries that we, are, that we would have to compile and to put on the laptop and so on. And again, the endpoint is, is hardened. So as you understood, the VPN agent still needs DNS to work because this will, this will be the only way for it to get the IP address of the um, um, gateway, uh, the VPN gateway. So naively we can think that maybe you can use DNS ourselves in order to establish some, some tunnel. And indeed, it works. So uh, indeed I mentioned some of the tools right here but um, uh, again we do not need any external tools to do this kind of things. We can simply use PowerShell for instance that is uh, capable of doing DNS on uh, LLMNR. The conclusion for this quick on naive attack is that it will work for uh, Cisco on Palo Alto. The UDP LLMNR will work with Palo Alto only and with EventT, nothing works. So it's not possible to try to establish a tunnel or to send some data over uh, DNS with EventT. We already found some discrepancies here that I will try to explain uh, later. Another example of attack that is highly effective uh, is if you are able to do some uh, Ethernet man in the middle like with SlimShim uh, Slim or this kind of things, uh, but they only make sense if you are inside the corporate environment and you have access to uh, um, network plugs. So uh, let's uh, uh, not discuss about this there. Um, the third option that we have based on the design issues of VPN always on is that we can try some other protocols that could be there and that could be useful and that could work. Uh, honestly, I wanted this talk to be about some crazy exfiltration uh, protocols and IDs that I have, but it was so easy to bypass the actual controls that uh, we can already forget about those, especially since I do not want to compile or to add some uh, new binaries to the, uh, to the victim machines. Okay, I mentioned DNS but we do not really need to comply with the DNS protocol. We can simply try to use uh, UDP 53 uh, as an outbound connection to try to uh, uh, send some uh, um, datagrams, you know. It will be much more uh, effective than a DNS tunnel because then we will have the full uh, uh, bandwidth that, that we can try to send. Uh, so I'm just putting there a very naive uh, PowerShell script because we can use the UDP client uh, PowerShell function that will allow us to send some uh, datagrams over the port that we like. Uh, and again, some kind of discrepancy there. Um, so this is the not DNS UDP 53. It will work with Cisco on Palo Alto, but again, not with EventT. So you might think that, okay, EventT managed to uh, implement a much better always on feature. Uh, wait for the end of this talk. For some reasons, uh, you might think that, okay, DNS worked, but we also need DHCP to be uh, working uh, even if we haven't always on uh, enabled. Well, it did not work at all for any of these three, and we will try to figure out uh, later. Another thing that I found interesting is a kind of lockdown grace period that can be observed for Cisco on EventT. So as long as, uh, as soon as we get the DHCP hack, uh, um, response with an IP in it, then for Cisco on EventT, it will take them between 4 to 10 seconds in my experience before the connection is, um, I would say, uh, locked um, again. Unfortunately, this is long enough 
to get this kind of screenshot that I know you, you like seeing on your screen, you are completely able to um, get the hashes of the user with responder or any other tool. Um, so this is well enough either to get this kind of hash or uh, to exfiltrate some small files already. So you have nothing to do um, just with this grace period, you can already uh, get some nice results. But again, another discrepancy with Palo Alto Global Protect, there is no such grace period observed. So again, something that we will try to answer later. So I mentioned captive portal detection. It's uh, kind of obvious what we will try to do there now. Um, if you remember some of the algorithms that uh, I explained about, okay, um, how can we determine if we are behind uh, captive portal or not, well then it's um, trivial to uh, spoof these kind of things and I'm just suggesting some IP tables that will allow you to uh, make the VPN agent to think that you are behind a captive portal and it will unlock some connectivity so that you can use that and authenticate. Um, so for event T on Palo Alto it's just with the AT, uh, HTTP, so TCP AT port. For Cisco, it just requires to uh, uh, redirect the uh, 443 as well, just because of the algorithm that they use. But now that we can pretend we are a captive portal, um, the VPN agent will unlock some connectivity and we can then try to steal credentials, we can try to establish a bidirectional uh, channel to exfiltrate data or to send some commands. So we can try that. Um, on the right, I wrote a very, very naive uh, captive portal web server uh, which will pretend that we have to authenticate to connect. So based on, thanks to the IP tables rules, we will redirect all the connections to that. And depending on the type of VPN agent, we will have, a, I would say, different uh, outcome. So for Cisco, um, by default, it's five minutes of unlocked access. We must use the embedded browser, but the embedded browser has all HTTP features that you might need to establish a, a tunnel or to exfiltrate some data. Uh, for uh, Pulse Secure or the new name of uh, Pulse Secure is Eventy, then it's not even restricted to the captive portal IP. So you can have access to the full LAN as long as Eventy believes that you are behind uh, a captive portal. But we are still forced to use the embedded browser. For Palo Alto, there is no restrictions on the binary that is authorized to connect on the network. So as long as you pretend you are uh, on you have a captive portal on the network, uh, you can then use any binary, any program to connect on the network. And then I'm just giving an example where um, we can simply use some HTTP form to upload some files and it was very naive. You can use any other more convenient web server that you want to, fi to do some file sharing, to do your uh, uh, C2, whatever, it can work uh, this way. Now I think it's time to move on to the most interesting attack, I believe, because it's definitely the most powerful one. It will completely uh, unlock the network access. So as I mentioned, the trusted network detection for the vulnerable ones, again, I have to insist, Cisco made a night job because they are the only ones to propose something that is secure enough. Uh, but for the other one, it's either IP values or DNS values that are pushed in uh, DHCP offers. And for some others, you also have to do some ping. Again, ping is trivial to spoof. Um, so if we combine all this information, uh, indeed, not only all these values can be spoofed, there is no authentication on these values, but they are also written in clear in the logs or in the configuration and they can also leak in the traffic. So you will be able to see all these values in the traffic and if you made some assumptions, you are not even, uh, you do not even need to understand everything uh, to actually spoof the trusted network detection. So we will try to pretend that our rogue network is the actual LAN and you will see that um, it will be happy with it. So I just give you an example with Cisco that has not been configured with the uh, trusted network the uh, secure version. So it's not uh, a TLS certificate there, but you can see that, okay, it will consider that we are on a trusted network, while that's not the case, obviously, um, and then that the network access is available. Yes, this is what we want to do, even though the Difcon bank does not exist at all, but Cisco will be happy with what we give in our DHCP offers. So let's try to exploit that. I will give the examples for the three. You will see that it's more or less the same. Um, on the left, we have, on the right, sorry, top right, we have an extract of the event uh, connection setting. So it is located at this pass, it is user readable, and you will find the connection policy there. 
that is a Boolean statement that will combine all the criteria, all the checks that are available. So if we want to avoid the VPN agent to force the connection, we just have to simply understand the Boolean logic here and try to inverse it. And we can do it one by one. So I will be using DNS mask as a DHCP server as well as the DNS server. I will simply say that, okay, let's look at every values that is expected there and I will propose everything so that event T will believe that it's on the social network. So I will use host record, I will just write what is expected there. DHCP branch, I will write something that match with what is expected there. On DHCP option six for the DNS server IP, I will just give it what it wants to read. If I do that, event T will consider that the device is connected to the internal network and completely unlock the network access. So uh, unfortunately for event T, they only implement weak or spoofable uh, trusted network detection check, uh, DNS server, DNS A records on interface IP branch. And you can select and you can create a very big statement since it will only be composed of these spoofable checks, you will always be able uh, to pretend you are the uh, trusted network. Let's move on to the uh, TND of Cisco. Again, if it is not configured with this secure trusted network, it will only use um, the trusted DNS domain on sometimes the uh, IP address of the internal DNS domain. These values can be found in the profile, um, in, in an XML file at this location. And if you do that, it will be enough for Cisco to consider that, okay, this is indeed the trusted network. Um, and since I like to work in a very convenient and easy way, I can also tell you that uh, if you run this command, that works, but you can also avoid any conflicts with your already running DNS mask, um, and you can use that on the, you know, default hotspot features on any user-friendly Linux distribution. If you put all these values there in the command line, you put them in the uh, DNS mask shared configuration, it will uh, peacefully run um, along your uh, already running DNS mask, and you will not even need to run any commands, actually, to spoof the trusted network. And let's uh, finish with Palo Alto because it's also vulnerable. This time it will not be in the configuration because uh, good for them, they decided to encrypt part of the configuration, that's nice. Unfortunately, uh, the same values are leaking in clear text in the logs. So you will find everything you need as well. There you will see the IP on the name of the host. On little trick, it's not a DNS A record that is expected, it's a DNS PTR record. So it will uh, require you to do some effort and to write the IP address in the inverse order, but once you do that, um, you are completely breaking free from the always on feature and you have access to that. So just to show you this, how quickly it can be in a short demo, on the left of the screen you will see the target machine with uh, a Cisco VPN agent, and on the right you will see uh, uh, my own Linux distribution with uh, D this DNS mask that, it, that is running. Okay, so I will first try with um, giving the nope.local, which is not the expected value. So we will see that when we do that, I'm trying some pings so that we can see the results uh, almost in real time. You will see that we might get some uh, ping response because of the um, um, grace period that I explained earlier because Cisco is, is vulnerable to that. Now since it is not the DHCP value, since it is not the um, uh, internal DNS domain, we will see that Cisco is not happy about that and will definitely try to connect to the um, uh, VPN gateway, which obviously does not exist for this one. But then I will try with what is expected on what I could see in the configuration file. I'm restarting my uh, DHCP server with the uh, DNS values that I want to uh, push. And after a few graphical glitches, then we should be able to see that uh, Cisco is happy with that. So we get the uh, ping replies. So meaning that the network is now completely unlocked and I just want to see the uh, graphical interface. Thanks. Yeah. So it's now happy, it considered that we are on a trusted network on that we have uh, completely unlocked the network access and now we can do whatever we want. 
So again, we did not need to understand how it is completely implemented. I did not need to reverse anything to understand all that. I just had to read the documentation and to do some uh, experiments with some assumptions. But we raised some questions, okay? We have some discrepancies between the VPN agents. We have some things that did not work while we expected uh, such DHCP or other um, um, protocols to work. Um, it was not the case. So we will now need admin privileges just to try to understand how it works and um, uh, try to get new attacks that might be working uh, without privileges, okay? So let's have a look at behind the scene. Behind the scene is the Windows filtering platform. I'm not going to explain it um, at length there because there are other talks that will um, deep dive in, in this. You just have to um, understand that it is an API that is provided by Microsoft so that you can interact with the uh, filtering engine of, of Windows. So the main idea is you have a provider that you can define, so it will be Cisco, Eventy, uh, Palo Alto for instance. They will open a session to the Windows engine, to the Windows kernel basically, um, and then they will define some layers and sub-layers which are network definitions, and then they will um, add, they will commit filters. And a filter will um, simply be something that you will uh, define as, okay, I want to block this protocol from this IP to this port on everything. You can define everything you want. And uh, the Windows firewall is actually using this API. So everything that is network filtering on, on Windows, on modern Windows platform is using uh, WFP. I'm showing there some API functions that we will be using later. So because it's using WFP, uh, the Windows filtering platform, we already have some nice tools on even one that is already built in Windows. It's part of the NetSH command. You can use NetSH WFP on show filters and it will show you all the filters that are currently enabled on the system. Uh, you can see there that since I just run this command, again, I have to be admin to uh, execute this command. I will get as an output a nice XML file that is quite clear um, to, to understand and I can see there the filter that is being um, committed by Eventy to block all the outgoing connection. So, so this is kind of an artifact of the um, uh, always on configuration there. And you will see that, okay, this is the name of the filter. This is connect v4, so it will uh, block all the outbound connection on IPv4. And then the main action there is block with no condition. So this is kind of the most important rule of the VPN uh, uh, always on feature. It will just block everything. So we can inspect all these rules with just a uh, simple command. And the other tools that I want to uh, talk about are uh, WFP Explorer from uh, Pavel Yosifovic and James Forshaw who made a lot of uh, WFP functions available in his nice NT object manager. Thanks to these two tools, we will be able to actually uh, impact and change the rules or specifically delete some, some rules. So, Let's have a look at the WFP Explorer. This is not, this is not an, an attack, it's not an exploit, it's just to prove that it's just by deleting the filters that have been committed to the, to the kernel, to the Windows filtering platform uh, um, uh, framework, we will be able to get our connectivity back. So I will obviously choose to delete this um, outgoing v4 uh, rule. Okay, same situation, the tunnel is not established so uh, I'm in lockdown mode, I cannot connect to anything. I will just select the rule, you can see on the right that as soon as I delete the rule, then uh, the connectivity is back for uh, ping to work. But again, that was just to uh, demonstrate or to illustrate uh, these filters. So, now that we know what we have to look at, I used and I obviously tried to inspect all the filters so that I could maybe find some um, nice hard-coded values, some backdoors on some things that could, be, that could be interesting. And I've done that with Palo Alto, Eventy, but for Cisco, it did not work. I could not see the filters that were implemented by Cisco for some reason. And it was kind of a big um, 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 problem for me because I really wanted to see all these filters. So none of the filters implemented by Cisco would show up in the uh, NetSH WFP uh, outcome, uh, uh, output, but 
uh, by enabling or by enabling the um, audit policy, you ca you could have a uh, look at all the things that are uh, being made, all the changes that are being made on WFP. So we can definitely select some event logs that will show the um, the fact that some filters are being committed. But on Cisco, they will commit filters very frequently, so it was very hard to follow. I really wanted to look at all the filters that were being implemented and being uh, pushed to the platform uh, live. So this is where I wrote some FRIDA scripts to hook all the calls to the API. It was quite long because I wanted to decode everything. On, um, uh, unfortunately, this was not necessary at all, but anyways, I'm using some code to do that. Uh, I will show you this example. So I'm injecting in the VPN agent binary. Um, what I want to do is simply to hook the uh, filter add uh, function on based on that, then I will pass all the structs, uh, follow all the pointers and so on, so that I can reconstruct the values that are being there uh, pushed in the filters. So by the way, Cisco chose a very nice lead grid there, you can see. But again, I'm happy now because I can look at my filters directly in live, but it will not show up if I'm trying to uh, ask the uh, API after that. On, I finally get this um, weird answer that access is denied. So maybe this is why I could not see all the filters on Indeed. Uh, one subtlety of the uh, WFP framework is that you can define some security descriptor that will block or reduce the access to the filters themselves, to the providers, um, on everything that you can that you can add to the uh, to the uh, filtering engine. Um, this security descriptor is a nightmare to parse because it's uh, with a lot of variables, some pointers, so it's, it's really hard to do that. Um, but I got the hint from James Forshaw himself to actually just dump the first values appointed by the um, security descriptor uh, pointer. And then we will try to uh, uh, pass them automatically with his uh, NT object manager and try to format that as a as security descriptor. And then we finally have this answer that if you want to look at all the filters that are being committed by Cisco, then you will see that system does not even have a read access to these filters. It only has write and delete access. If you want to read these filters, you will need to be local service because only local service has open on read. So we got our answer there. But it's not over. We still need to craft a token that will show um, that we can be uh, local service. So again, kudos to James Forshaw who actually gave me the uh, trick on, on Twitter where we discussed about that. And we can see there that we just need to define the token with the um, uh, local service uh, uh, value there. So you can see that if I'm opening the engine without um, this token, then I get no result right here, get filter. If for all Cisco filter, then I got no uh, answer. But if I'm actually using the engine um, that I uh, use, that I, for which I open a session with the proper token, then I finally get all the filters. So that was kind of good news, even if I spent several weeks writing something to dump in the, in the function, I just had to do that. But anyways, I got my answers. The other way to do that is since we are able to hook the um, um, functions, we can also try to change these values. So uh, another alternative to do that is to uh, uh, either hook the function call and set the SID on the DACL to null so that everyone, every admin will get uh, direct access to the filters or eventually you can uh, use your uh, admin access to first become owner of the object and then you will be able to change the DACL. So those are just uh, some POC code that I'm releasing as well as uh, they are not so uh, complex. But again, you need to be admin to do that. So now that we managed to get the list of filters, we can now um, uh, answer our questions on if we take them one by one. DHCP was not usable at all because all the permit filters specify the source port as well. This is not possible on Windows if you do not have privileges, so this is why it could not work. Um, the fact that we cannot use TCP DNS on TCP LNMNR, well, that's similar. The permit filters are only defined for UDP protocols. Um, the fact that we could not use even DNS tunnel with Eventy, it's because Eventy only permits a system process 
uh, to be able to use the EDP53 because with uh, Windows filtering platform, you can even define a user, a system, accounts, groups, uh, and you can define who can access the network based on, this, on these values. And finally, for the grace period that is not observable for, observable for Global Protect, it's because Global Protect is using uh, persistent filters and not dynamic filters. So the filters are already there at all time, and only when it's happy with, what, uh, with the connection, it will decide to remove that. So unfortunately, I could not explain all the attacks that I managed to find. Um, but if you see this table, again, I insist, it's only unprivileged techniques. So I really want to be able to do this kind of um, um, uh, break-free exercise of, of uh, VPN always on. But you can see that none of the VPN agent is perfect because they are always vulnerable to at least one of the attack that I explained there. I still, f I also found some hard-coded values, but uh, uh, you do not even need to do that because they are most of the time vulnerable to the um, uh, trusted network detection, which is, in my op opinion, the most important one and the most flexible one. When it comes to recommendation, I try to prepare this um, uh, talk with all the ideas that I have for uh, detecting all the attacks that I could imagine or that I, that I demonstrated, but it's not practical at all. You have to do some correlation. Uh, ETW will not give you all the nice answers that you are looking for, so you will have to do um, a lot of things. So let's not waste our time on detection opportunities there, and let's directly move on to the prevention part. Um, the security agency in France wrote a very nice report which is full of uh, guidelines and they are a bit extreme but I think that I agree with them. Uh, if you want to circumvent the captive portal problem then uh, do not connect to a captive portal and always connect your laptop through a smartphone access point for instance. So you would use 3, 4, 5G just to avoid being connected to any Wi-Fi network that you do not trust. Uh, the other um, way to do that, I think, um, and I think they are right, you can use your smartphone that will connect to the captive portal and then your laptop will connect through the uh, smartphone. I think that works uh, quite well on Android devices. I'm not sure for uh, iOS. When it comes to the trusted network detection, well, they concluded well before me that most of the mechanisms are not secure, uh, except the one from Cisco that is relying on a certificate hash. Um, and the other idea they have, I think it's promising, but not so convenient, is to deploy an internal VPN gateway as well. In that case, there will no, never be any uh, notion of uh, trusted network. It will either be connected to the internal gateway or the external gateway. So it's a bit extreme, but it works. Um, and from the recommendation from this research, uh, I would say that from a configuration point of view for the blue team there, you will need to check the access rights. You might want to change them because uh, uh, use simple users have access to settings on logs and you might also consider looking at your TND on um, CPD settings. Um, for the implementation issues, well, now that you get uh, uh, to know the various weaknesses of the VPN agents, depending on your own uh, uh, provider, you might um, uh, consider changing a bit how you are configuring them. And eventually, you can consider deploying your own WFP filter. But then you will need to know the um, API provided by Microsoft. It is well documented, uh, but it's not so convenient. So good luck with that. Key takeaways, um, again, as I said, always on can be a bit off sometimes. Uh, definitely VPN agents are not securing the always on feature in the same way. None of them is perfect, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, naive attacks work. You do not need privileges. You do not uh, always need to have access to the laptop that you are attacking on all the information that you need, uh, for instance, to do the trusted network spoofing, uh, are found in uh, files that are accessible uh, to the um, low privilege user, even sometimes on the packets themselves, if you are able uh, to do some uh, man in the middle or just to look at what's happening on the, on the wire. 
Uh, TND spoofing, again, from my point of view, is the most convenient on generic technique. Um, and for the rest, most of the answers can be found in the documentation itself, as well as in open, so open source tools uh, that are well made and that will give you all the answers that you need, provided that, provided that uh, uh, you uh, uh, are able to look at the uh, trap that I, I uh, fall into with the Cisco uh, settings. And finally, IT admins have to consider configuration mistakes because even if we have weaknesses in the VPN agents themselves, uh, we also form in many occurrences um, the, uh, the, the fact that the IT admins change the settings so the end user would also be able to change the profiles on the settings themselves. So uh, it's not demonstrated there, but it is also something to consider. Thank you very much for your attention.